We're good. Okay. So what I'm going to discuss today is about uh, foraging and enrichment. And as you watch this presentation, don't think of this as a parrot discussion. Think of it as a discussion that will apply to all the animals you see, whether that is a dairy cow, whether that is some type of deer species, or um, a turkey, or a chicken, or a hedgehog, or whatever you deal with as, and have as patients. So this next video, I want you to watch. This to me sums up the current state of enrichment, especially in Sioux. So I hope you enjoy this. <laughs> So, they want to see natural behaviour, don't they? Not that natural. Fine, I'm going for a swim. What's the matter, love? Oh, I don't know, Mum. I just feel a bit depressed. Oh, have you been on the tyre? Yes, I've been on the tyre. Oh, right. Um... It's just not enough anymore. I don't feel like a real polar bear. I've never been out there in the wild. Life in the Arctic is very overrated, Shane. Isn't it, Ian? Uh, uh, what? Life in the wild. It's very overrated, isn't it? Oh, well, uh, yes. Uh, apart from the sex, of course. <laughs> she doesn't want to hear about that sort of thing. Actually, I would quite like to hear that. <laughs> to the harsh realities of life in the Arctic. How you always had to be on your guard. Oh, yes. Especially on one night stands, because in the winter, the nights lasted for months. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, Claudia. Uh, dangerous. Well, sometimes you had to swim under ice to catch fish. Oh, do you swim under ice? Fish live under rocks and in buckets? No, love. Fish live in the sea. It's the keepers that put them under the rocks to try and make it a bit interesting for us, you know, give us a challenge. But there's only six rocks. Well, there were originally ten, but your father found it a bit too challenging. Personally, I think you're better off here, Shane. It's temperate, you get your food laid on, and you've got your name down for the captive breeding program, right? Mm. Yeah. What's that? With the captive breeding program? Oh, that. It has been a great success over recent years. It's been a great success for you, you mean. Don't start this again, Gary. Oh, come on. I saw the big smile you had on your face when you came back from San Diego. Oh, for the hundredth time. Nothing happened in San Diego. How can you talk like this in front of your son? If he really is my son. That's the question, isn't it, Claudia? How dare you? Right, Shane, how about a swing on the tire, then? Now, just look at him. He's nothing like me. He's not fat and impotent, if that's what you mean. <laughs> So, you know, that's kind of the way we have done enrichment is we have a few things here and there and we think, oh, well, we've added this stuff to the environment and the animals are magically happy. And of course, it doesn't exactly work like that. And enrichment is a complicated process because you can't make one enrichment program that fits all, not even one species. So we really have to look at it as an individual process for every single animal that we're dealing with. There's a statement, this is an old statement, of course I can't remember who said it, but give me the boy until the age seven and I will give you the man. What that means is that by the young age, in this case humans, by the age of seven, you have set some ideas and skill sets and so forth that will carry you through your life. That same principle can be applied towards animals. And what I mean by this in terms of enrichment is we want to expose young animals to these enrichment ideas and get them involved with being interactive with their environment, learning these skill sets at a very young age. Because we know, and you've probably seen um, some older animals, especially birds and others, that you try to introduce something new and they look at it, they just kind of, it's this strange thing that they don't know what to do with it. And a lot of times we have to teach animals enrichment because they've never learned these skills. So my next question for you is, and this is a audience participation, so which animal do you think will be the most difficult of the domestic species? So don't get into the weird animals, just the common domestic species. Which one do you think would be most difficult to get into forage? Cats, because they're lazy. That's a good answer. Everybody good with cats? Okay, I would say so too. So I want to show you a case um, where we use enrichment. So, Enrichment shouldn't just be this esoteric idea where we think about 
how we can enrich the animal's life. We want to apply it to clinical cases so we can use it to improve the welfare of the animal, and in this case, the owner also. So this particular cat, um, when I first saw it, it was named, uh, it was eight years old, his name is Matthew. This is one of those cats that um, is always wanting attention, clawing at you, meowing constantly, and it worked great for many years until the owner developed these crippling migraines. And the migraines were such a problem that when the owner would sit down, kind of in pain, and trying to be a dark alone, the cat, Mackie, would go up and start clawing at her and everything, and it actually made things worse. The problem was she came to us because she was desperate. You know, do we drug the cat? What do we need to do? Because I can't handle all of this, um, you know, meowing and constant tension. It was actually causing problems. So she was debating on getting rid of the cat. I said, all right. Let's do something, and this is something we do with a lot of our really high energy cats. And yes, a lot of cats are lazy, and it's hard to get them to do much of anything, except for waddle to the food bowl. However, some of these cats are really energetic and require some other things. So I want to show you this video. So this is a real case, and I'll try to video. Meet this. Ryan, a cat owner. While many would say that their pets are unique and would do anything for them, Ryan has had to make special accommodations for her cat. Ryan developed migraines that severely limited her interactions with her cat, resulting in feline distress and further contributing to the severe headaches. The situation seemed hopeless as Ryan contemplated relinquishing her cat. After talking with her local veterinarian, an idea emerged to teach her cat to forage. What you have been watching is Ryan hiding cat food all over her house. Meet Mackie, a 13-year-old cat that Ryan found as a stray. Ryan described Mackie as inquisitive, talkative, and demanding of attention. Mackie has always been a happy and affectionate cat. However, upon developing recurring migraines, Ryan simply could not spend as much time with Mackie. Subsequently, Mackie became more demanding, further exacerbating Ryan's medical condition. The solution? Give Mackie a job. After placing Mackie behind closed doors, Ryan hides food throughout her house. All the while, Mackie is crying with excitement, waiting for the door to open. Once Mackie's daily food is hidden, the door opens and the hunt begins. Mackie knows that anywhere he can reach is fair game. This includes looking for food on and in furniture, kitchen appliances, and more. If Mackie can reach it, there just might be a food treat waiting. This hide-and-seek game with food takes Ryan approximately 5 to 10 minutes to set up and is now a daily occurrence. The end result is that Mackie's inquisitive nature, basic hunting instincts, and desire for exploration are quenched. In turn, this has reduced Mackie's demand for attention from Ryan. That is not to say that Ryan does not interact with Mackie, because she does. While cat and owners still enjoy each other's company, Mackie does not constantly cry or give the longing looks as he did during his mundane, bowl-feeding days. Half of the fun is simply watching Mackie explore. Sometimes Ryan will even direct Mackie with hand signals, in case he misses a morsel. After all, Ryan does not want leftover cat food scattered around her house. And certainly, no one wants cat food with their wine. The process is such a daily ritual that both Mackie and Ryan notice when a foraging day is skipped. Mostly, it is Mackie that lets Ryan know there was no hunt today. After it is all said and done, Mackie knows how to relax after a hard day's work in front of the fire. All right, so I bring this up because this is a real life situation, and this type of problem is something we commonly encounter. And you know, working back to traditional books and so forth, they discuss uh, certain uh, anti-anxiolytics and other medications, and I can tell you, I, I cannot remember the last time I prescribed a drug to manage separation anxiety and some of these other things. We do a lot of it with enrichment. And now while enrichment, some people want the magic pill. I'm sure that's true here, like it is in the States, so they don't want to take forth the effort. But we really work with people to try to talk to them about developing protocols that will help both the owner and the animal. And what I'm going to discuss in this presentation is when you devise an enrichment program, if it doesn't work for the owner, it doesn't work, period. So you have to make something that works and is acceptable to the owner. And as this video shows, Ryan, the owner, when I went to her house, I, I wasn't prepared the first time I went to bring the camera for what I was going to need to see because all we knew from the exam room was that Mackie was doing fine. You know, everything is solved. And I said, well, did you do this program? She said, yes. And she said, you ought to come over to the house and show it to you. So I said, okay. So I came there and things happened so fast. I, I couldn't get, I was chasing this cat around with a camera everywhere. And I said, all right, let me come back another day. Now I can 
see the pattern a little bit better and I can film it. But we use this quite a bit with cats, we use it with dogs, with foraging programs and so forth. There's a lot of simple things. These buster cubes, I don't know if you have them here, or feeding balls or cubes where they have a hole in it. You put food into it and you can adjust the dial, the size of the opening, so that the food just pops out one at a time. So rather than the bowl feeding, which we, it's kind of like a dirty word with some of my clients. You know, we talk, I say, do you feed from a bowl? Like, yes. <laughs> so we really try to work with other things so that they can incorporate foraging. Now realize some animals do fine bowl fed and not have an issue. They've got plenty of other stimulus and exercise and activity. So we really work on it, not with every case, but with certain ones. So certainly, if we can modify a cat's behavior, a lot of people think of them as lazy animals. And the nice thing about enrichment for cats, it usually takes five or 10 minutes once or twice a day for the really high energy cats. So they're pretty easy, in my experience, to manage it's with these cats that go in and attacking legs. You know, when people walk by, they bite them and do all these other things. We, a lot of times we can manage them by doing some of these activities. So again, hopefully we can do this with birds, our parrot species. We also use this with programs. I do a lot of enrichment programs for different types of animals, zoos, collections, private collections, um, research institutions. So we, we can apply these techniques for all sorts of animals. And as we go through this, I'm going to show you cases and have, ask for your input as to what we can do, what's the problem, how might we manage this, and so forth. So if any of you have seen Captain Forger, Missy is a consummate forager that has learned to spend time doing a productive behavior, forage. As you can see, Missy chews on her feathers and has done so for many years. By giving her toys that require her to work for her meals, Missy has redirected her destructive behaviors to constructive activities. Here, Missy works with a foot toy that is filled with food items that can only be removed by breaking up the pieces little by little and extracting them through the holes in the toy. Birds working with these foot toys spend a significant amount of time trying to retrieve their meal. This in turn occupies the bird's time and mental and even some physical energy. This type of toy can be used both inside and outside of the bird's cage. These foot toys are especially good for birds that must be left in their cage for long periods of time. One important note that is in order for foraging to be most effective, the bird should be required to forage for the majority of its meal. In this scenario, food items are hidden in a coconut foraging toy that is typically hung within the cage or on a foraging tree branch. Missy knows exactly what to do and goes straight for the toy. While Missy masterfully navigates these toys, she has had a very slow start and began her foraging career with simple toys. Over time, Missy graduated to more complicated toys. Your bird's prior experiences and skill level will dictate which foraging toys to begin with. It is important to work with your bird to determine where to begin with its foraging experience. Be patient and learn with your bird. Foraging is an important and natural behavior that once learned is favored by most birds compared to the more commonplace bowl feeding. All right, so and just a little bit of background on Missy. She was given to me uh, years ago and she was a mess. I'm probably, I was probably at that time the sixth or seventh owner. It took me three months just to get to the point where she would sit on a, a tree outside the cage. So she was so freaked out by it. And then we spent several months just doing basic foraging, get her up to speed. Once we did that, you're basically creating incompatible behaviors. You can't chew on your feathers and forage at the same time. And, and it worked great, except I started traveling and lecturing and all this other stuff. And every time I would go away, she would defoliate and clip all her feathers off. So now she actually lives with one of the nurses that I worked with. So just a note about the captive foraging video, I made it, I didn't sell it or produce it. The, um, the company that makes it uh, closed down. So I asked them and they are making that video free online. So if you just go to avianstudios.com, it's, on, it's online, so it's for free. All right, so in the United States, we have legislation, the Animal Welfare Act, AWA, that has been in place to provide standards for a variety of different animals. They really don't have much in 
in terms of birds, but we certainly see it with other animals, especially primates and a lot of research animals. So these regulations and these modifications keep changing with that. So what I would like you to think about during this presentation is, if you think about all the systems of the body, we have the nervous system, we have the reproductive system, cardiovascular system, think of behavior as its own system, all right? And just think of it in terms that if the behavior system is out of whack, there's gonna be problems. And just like heart disease can affect the kidney and vice versa, so can the, the behavior, behavioral disease can affect other systems. So let me give you a great example. Who has ever had stress diarrhea? All right, yes, all right. That's an example where behavior has affected you systemically. All right, that's just, that's one of many. And there's of course a lot of research out that shows we can affect immune system, we can induce um, seemingly on paper, meaning lab changes, induce diseases with behavioral changes. We can really see that. So we know that this system, while it may not be a physical system, is for real and that it can relate and affect other body systems and the organism as a whole. So if the behavior is out of whack, the animal is not exactly going to be so that's one thing I want you to think about. So the other question is, well, what exactly is environmental enrichment? Because it is a vague concept for a lot of people. And I would say that the best definition I have seen is really to allow the animal to perform species typical behaviors. So we want things that can allow the animal to do what it is designed to do naturally. Okay? That doesn't mean that we can't have it do things that we never do in the wild, because we can. But we want to work upon its own skill set and what it's inherently designed to do. Birds are designed to do what? Fly, forage for food, and other things. And we really restrict that by keeping them in cages. Now, I have a bird in a cage. So I'm not up here saying that all of you who have caged birds are bad. I'm with you. It's, it's a matter of trying to figure out how to make it work with our schedule and our lifestyle. And certainly we can't just take these birds and release them back into the wild in a lot of situations. So I'm not even suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is thinking differently how we keep our animals. So species typical information is important enough. So this is where we understand the biology of the animals better. So field notes or whatever, Wikipedia works great. You know, there's a lot of information out there that tells us natural behavior of animals. It also means that if we introduce something as an enrichment protocol to the, for the animal, it has to be relevant, biologically relevant for that animal. If you put a giant complicated toy in for a budgie, it's probably not going to have any success doing anything with it. It's not relevant to that animal. And if you put you know, another type of toy that just doesn't work for the animal, again, it may look cool, it may work, and maybe you have an animal that has arthritis and it can't get around and climb around and use that. So it's not relevant to that animal as well. So you have to think about the individual species. So then we have to ask the question, what in the world is abnormal behavior? Because there's obviously a huge spectrum of behaviors that can be considered normal, and some people might decide that this one is abnormal and that one's not. So what do we define as abnormal? Well, there are a couple of guidelines that we could say that might be considered abnormal. And again, these are not 100% applicable to every animal. But one thing is, is the behavior only seen in captivity? For example, stereotypies or stereotypies, depending on how you want to pronounce them. If it is noted in the wild and captivity, is the behavior performed excessively, like constant screening? So screening for a parrot would not serve, if it was constant, would not be a very good behavior to have in the wild, because you're gonna attract predators and so forth, and it could be an obvious issue. Or does it cause inappropriate, or use in inappropriate circumstances, such as killing a cage man? Now we know that a lot of animals fight in the wild, and a lot of times they're able to get away, the loser gets away, and there may be consequences, they may not survive the injuries. However, in a cage surrounding, there's no way for the two birds to necessarily get away from each other. Um, is the behavior specific to a subset of animals? We certainly have strains of animals that perform very abnormal behaviors, and we, we're actually using them, especially with mice and rats, in a number of behavior studies. Is the behavior self-injurious? Does it cause like self-mutilation? Uh, does it affect social interactions like barbering a cage mate or chewing on a cage mate? Um, and does it have other consequences for growth and reproduction? Those 
resources, like the mom feeding inappropriate food to the baby. Uh, does the behavior induce obvious signs of distress? And again, we can see some variations of these things in the wild. Um, we do see that with macaw chicks and others, sometimes the parents don't appropriately feed certain babies. They're inexperienced or whatever the thing may be. So these things do sometimes happen in the wild, but we have to look at the overall picture of the captive animal. Okay, then we can divide behaviors into maladaptive and malfunctional behaviors. Maladaptive behaviors are when we take an animal that is presumably normal and we put it in an abnormal environment. And what it does is it tries to adapt to that environment. And uh, they sometimes will develop behavior problems out of that. Malfunctional behavior has more to do with brain neurochemistry abnormalities. This is where they're not, they're not performing properly in whatever environment you put them in. A maladaptive behavior can turn into a malfunctional behavior. We know that we can chemically and physically change the brain over time. So you can have long-standing maladaptive behaviors turn into malfunctional behaviors. So my question is, what species of bird is that? Collectus, is it a male or a female? I have male. It's both. It's got uh, male and female so we, you probably maybe see these rarely. We see them in a number of species, but sometimes the collectors will split down the middle, left side male, right side female, or vice versa. And you see these interesting combinations. Okay. So enrichment and what is beneficial enrichment, enriching varies for the species. So what is that animal up there? Capybara, yeah, largest rodent in the world. And in Texas, they're kept as pets, believe it or not. So I saw a number of capybaras when I was uh, in Texas. So, where do capybaras live? South America and what type of environment? Before, well, they, they live in swampy floodplains, riverine environments, and so forth. They swim in and out of mud, and they tromp in the mud and eat grasses. Okay? So, when we see capybaras that are kept in the basement and fed ding dongs and Twinkies and other things, mm -hmm. they love them, they love the sugar. But we obviously have a lot of problems and they develop behavior issues. So my question, next one is, what is the most enriching item for mice? A wheel. A wheel, we have a wheel, what else? Sunflower seeds. What? Sunflower seeds. <laughs> Very fat heat. Okay, what else? Lots of substrate. Lots of substrate. Any other guesses? I'm sorry? Um, so things to hide it and run around it. Okay, things to hide and run around it. It's actually substrate. It's and here's the reason you may not think about it initially, like, well, substrate, I don't get it. I'm sure they sell hamsters, gerbils, and other things here at the pet stores, right? No. They do not. They're illegal, no. right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> All right, in the States, we, have, we, we sell everything. You can go buy a tiger or a lion or whatever you want. So we have it available. If you want it, you can get it. All right, so people sell these hamster cages, which I guess you do not, do not have, and they put about two inches of substrate. What has been shown to be scientifically shown to be beneficial is eight to 15 inches of substrate. And the reason is that's how they maintain their body temperature. We know that the body temperature range for uh, small rodents living in colonies is between 84 and 86 degrees. That's their preferred optimal temperature zone. We talked about that with reptiles, right? Okay, and for singles it's between 86 and 88. The way they maintain that temperature is by having all that data. Okay, and they also tunnel in there and do everything else. So you can see the question is, well, what are they doing on two inches of packed you know, shavings or whatever? Well, they're cold. And when they've been studied, they have all the stress hormones and all the indications of stress. So it's like living in a chronic stress environment. So imagine if you are constantly cold all the time or however. So that's an example of where we, we introduce. So when we see pet rodents, the first thing I do is tell them, all right, you need another tank with a tube attached to this cage that's totally inappropriate for your rodent, but have the, the tube go to the other tank and fill it with paper, shredded paper, and then go in and burrow. So we have these great videos of these, these uh, mice and other things just kind of burrowing, and then they tend to stay over there, and then they come back over and run on the wheel, or they you know eat some food or do some other things. Okay, so allowing animals increased use of the environment and control of their environment, so having options, you know, to uh, to do some things. That is really considered an act of animal welfare. And we say that, you know, 
if you have one option, there's really no choice, right? If we have two options of things to do, that's a dilemma. So we really want three or more things for these, these animals to choose from their environment. And that's hard to do in a small, restricted cage. So um, it doesn't matter what type of animal you're talking about. So in the research, of course, there's a lot of information on enrichment, especially with, um, with primates. And you can see a lot of these behaviors. And we see these in our captive animals. We see them especially in uh, birds. We even see dogs doing self-injurious behaviors, you know, licking raw spots and other things. So there's a lot of different behaviors that we see. And I, I would say that just about all of these are things that we see in pet birth. Maybe we don't recognize number six, stressful research protocols. Pretty much everything else we recognize as problems in our captive birds. And of course, it's a huge problem with primates. Highly intelligent, physically large animals especially, very strong. So you have to create these incredibly strong cages. And yes, people have a lot of pet primates in the state. I assume they're not here also. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't recommend it. So um, yeah, we, we have a lot of uh, primate issues. And you'll probably see them on the news when the chimpanzee rips off someone's face or something like that. And unfortunately, that is something we run into. OK, so again, I think that with the exception of these stressful research protocols, we have the same issues in our captive birds. Okay, so we can look at enrichment in, in terms of two different ways. One is the preventative type, and the other one is therapeutic intervention. Therapeutic intervention is where most of the studies are. And they're limited in birds, but we do have some. And there's very few on prevention. So there's a lot more preventative studies in, say, primates and rodents and other things. And what we really should be concentrating on is the prevention side of things. And a lot of times, by the time you and I are going to see these animals, they're at the stage where we're talking about therapeutic. So we're already behind the eight ball. We're trying to catch up and change the system. And again, a lot of these animals never learned these skill sets. They were never exposed to them. They were, they were more or less raised in a barren environment. And they have very limited skill sets. And we're trying to train them to do something that is more challenging. So, um, I wish we would get more preventative studies, so I'm hopefully encouraging some budding scientists out there to do more of these types of studies. So I want to go through now the second part of this presentation on, um, on uh, foraging and how it affects uh, feather damage and behavior and um, other behaviors as well. So foraging, we know that self-destructive behaviors are very common in captive birds. And I know they're common here as well with, with a lot of our birds and animals. We see them a lot with citizen species. However, they're well documented in other, you know, we have pet crows and all sorts of other things. We see it with those birds as well. And again, the primates, um, the, I think the primate owners are, I have no offense to anybody who has family who owns primates, but they're kind of crazy, all right? They're, they're not kind of crazy, they're a lot of crazy. And we have to work with these people, try to explain them to them about you know, the challenges of keeping primates, and they come in with diapers, and they're walking them, and they're putting them in strollers, and everything else, and we really have to work with these people to get them to think a little bit more about what these, bird, these uh, animals normally do. So we have these cases, okay? This is extreme. Now, this bird died, not because it plucked out all its feathers, because of some uh, totally unrelated problem, but you know, these are kind of extreme cases, and but we see all variations. Now, I also have to bring up that there are medical causes of feather damaging behavior. And we don't want to look at this and say, oh, these are all just behavioral. They're not. In fact, the vast majority of feather damaging that we see has a medical component. So a lot of times behavior goes into it. This is because of an ovarian cyst. And when I went and surgically removed the cyst, the bird grew its feathers back the first time in year. So there are definitely medical problems. Here's a bacterial dermatitis or folliculitis case in an Amazon. So again, yeah, I just bring these up. This one you probably are unfortunately familiar with, cystic being feather disease and circovirus infection. So again, there are certainly medical issues that we have to keep in mind. And we don't want to just say, ah, oh, your bird is pulling its feathers. It must be behavioral. Let's work on enrichment. Let's work on enrichment, yes. However, let's also try to figure out what else is going on, do a complete workup, and really assess this animal and figure out what else we need to be concerned about. So foraging is simply the act of looking for food. And in a lot of the field notes, most of the field notes of birds, 
they spend 50% or more of their active day, meaning the waking hours, looking for food. That's a significant amount of time because obviously during the nighttime, most of these diurnal species are sleeping. So we're just talking about even a smaller window of time and half that time is being spent looking for food. So Cheryl Mann, who is at UC Davis and written that foraging is one of the most severely restraining classes of behavior in captive parrots. She's at UC Davis again. I went and talked with her and they noted that 96% of their captive orange wing Amazons were doing abnormal behaviors. When they actually went to study it, she said, I remember her telling me that she, she wasn't, she's not really a veterinarian, she's more of a behaviorist. And, and she walked into this room with all these parrots and saw them doing all these strange behaviors. She said she was so excited. She went and talked to her students and said, we gotta go work on these birds. They're all crazy, they're all nuts. So she looked at it as an opportunity and she very quickly <coughs> realized, wait a minute, this is a very sad situation and then doing more research, finding that this is a common problem. So, if we look at this Galapagos finch, all right, we have to think about enrichment protocols that are gonna be very different from, say, a merlin, all right? And, you know, obviously having a bird of prey in the cage, we do see feather damaging with those birds as well. Um, you know, we're gonna have to treat that bird very different from that finch. Okay, anybody know what this is? Booby, yes, blue-footed booby. And this is the magnificent frigate bird. So has anybody ever seen the interactions of these two birds? Yes, okay. Have you been to the Galapagos? Yeah. Wonderful, okay. So I wanna show you how these birds interact. And then I want you to think about, oh, how can we keep these as pets? All right, so there's the magnificent frigate bird being magnificent. Look how beautiful he is, he's showing everybody. There's the blue-footed booby with, with her family. So here's what boobies do. They dive bomb. <whistles> Boom. And they get fish. Pop up and they eat fish. All right. The frigate birds are marauders. They're kleptoparasitic birds, meaning they steal food from other birds. Evil creatures. All right. So here's mom feeding her baby. She just is going to bark up some food for her baby. And the frigate bird goes over. Everybody makes a bunch of noise. Frigate bird goes off. All right, so things are cool. Mom looks around and says, all right, baby, let's get back to eating. So I had to slow this down to see what actually happened. So here we go. There's the frigate birds coming down, taking food out of the baby's mouth. How evil is that? And then, of course, this guy's just standing out like nothing's going on. All right, so again, think about that. How would I reproduce that as a behavior if I was going to keep frigate birds, for example? How would I do that? It'd be pretty hard, okay? Or even a booby. It'd be very hard to have a pet booby, in my opinion. It'd be, it'd feel good about it. All right. So here's another one. Now look at this behavior. This is a uh, an egret. This is in Texas. And you see what he's doing. Now watch his feet. Look at him. He's shaking up the ground and kind of the moss in there, and he's looking for a little fish. Okay. There's a big fish staring him down. <laughs> And that's a, a black belly whistling duck, they're native. All right, so he's not interested in that big fish. Okay, so now look at this plover. Look what he's doing. Same thing, except he's got nothing to catch because he's in an enclosed environment. So he is expressing a natural behavior and getting nothing from it. So we see sometimes, we see these, and you have to watch what's normal behavior to see these, and you can pick them up. So he's trying to scare away some insects so he can catch them or some little water food. These are um, coastal birds and, and, and so they live in fields. And he's not very successful because all he's got is a bowl of food. So when, when I was first doing enrichment um, and different facilities would ask me to come in, they wanted me to talk to them about enrichment. What I did is I'd go the day before and I filmed their animals doing abnormal behaviors. And I put them in the presentation that I was going to give them the next day. And I would say, now here's this behavior, and the staff would look at it like, is that, is that our bird? Because they just told me that we don't actually have any problems with our birds, they just want us to come talk, they want me to come talk to them about enrichment, and yet I use, for all the different abnormal behaviors, I use their birds and their animals in the presentation. And they're like, huh, maybe this is more common. So when you go to facilities, whether that's somebody's house, an aviary, or a zoo, or um, you know, something like that, Pay attention to the animals and see what they're doing. Okay. Are they acting in a normal behavior or are they just sitting there like statues for hours on end, which would not be normal behavior for most.
most species. So just kind of take a look at that. All right, and one of these studies was done in or at um, UC Davis. They looked at orange wing Amazons, they put cameras on them. And again, we know that most birds spend 50% of their day looking for food. What they found is they were about a half hour to an hour looking for food, which meant waddling on the perch from left to right to the food bowl, eating, waddling back. How many people of you have seen the pile of poop, you know what I'm talking about, on the bottom of the cage? It's in one location, right? That's because they've waddled from here, the poop site, to the food site, back to the poop site, all right? And that's an indication you very quickly see when the birds come into the cage and you see the pile, all right? Maybe they haven't changed out the papers. If they change out the papers, you won't see it, but you can very quickly see and get an idea. Now, if it's a travel cage, that really doesn't tell you, but if that is their cage at home, you kind of very quickly start to see, oh, that's what this bird is doing, nothing. All right. There's all sorts of other really cool behaviors. I'm just going to go over a few of them. There's caching behavior. These are the birds that, and I'm not as familiar with the Australian species, um, but these birds um, uh, use different cues, whether it's environmental or spatial cues or other things, to hide foods. And they have some really cool behaviors. Um, Clark's nutcracker, which is um, a bird that we see in the Intermountain West, the Rocky Mountains, and so forth, they have this incredible ability to hide its, their food. So in the uh, fall, especially, they'll hide food in different areas, and they have a 72% recovery rate. Can you imagine reading a book, studying for finals, and then even a month later, remembering 72% of that information? I wish I had that. I mean, that's amazing, and, and they've noted up to 80% depending on the species. So some really cool abilities of these birds. Um, there's, uh, I'll get into some other, the Paraday group of birds, so I'll explain those in a moment. Um, wildfowl, this is kind of interesting that we know how comparing wild animals to captive animals, there's a lot of interesting differences. So wildfowl, when they're out in the jungle, they go from food patch to food patch, never depleting the food patch. So they just go and eat a little bit, they leave and go to the next site, leave and go to the next site. And there's a couple strategies that we think they're doing that. One is, if you stay in any place one too long, what happens? Somebody's going to eat you. All right, there's gonna be a pattern established that so something will eat you. The other thing is, what if you need to get some food again and you at least know a couple different sites, you can always come back and be another possibility. But if you look at captive wildfowl, what do they do? They go to one site and they pig out. They just sit there and gorge themselves, which is fine when you don't have predators all around you, but it's not so good when you're in the wild. So there's definitely some differences that we see. Okay, chaffinches, um, in this particular study, they had uh, wild-caught chaffinches and then captive rear cap chaffinches, and they had a silhouette of a hawk go over the cage. The wild chaffinches, as soon as that silhouette came into view, they were gone. Okay. However, the, the captive rear birds just kept eating, and they're like, oh, what's that? You know, and, and ultimately, it scared them, and they, they scattered. So they're a little slower, and obviously, that's not a very good survival uh, instinct. Okay, I think some of the Paraday studies, um, these are the, the blue tits, the mountain chickadees, and so forth are very, very cool. Um, they have what's called episodic memory, mental time travel. Sounds really cool, right? That is the ability to go back in time and recall information and act upon it appropriately, as opposed to go from time A to B to C to D and never going back. So elephants have episodic memory, the ability to remember and go back. Humans, dolphins, many of the uh, more intelligent animals tend to have episodic memory. So what they have done is they have actually looked at the hippocampus, which is our memory storage, or what we believe is the memory storage also in animals, and they've evaluated that. <coughs> what they've noted is that the Colorado okay, chickadees have a smaller hippocampus than, say, the Alaskan chickadees. Okay? And if you think about North American geography, um, Alaska is far further north, longer, much longer winters. So if you're going to survive a winter, and you hide food, you better be able to remember a lot more information to be able to make it through the winter. Okay, so Colorado chickadees have a shorter winter. So then they also looked at captive chickadees, okay, that didn't have to forage and find food because they went to the food bowl. Any, any ideas on how big their hippocampus was? Very small, okay. So we can physically change the brain just by changing activities. And it's, it's no different from working out a muscle. If you don't work out the muscle, it's going to atrophy 
and pay away other than just basic minimum amounts. Okay, scrub jays are another one. Scrub jays have this, uh, they do all these studies, kind of fun studies with scrub jays. So they put them in cages, they give them food to go hide, um, and then they have cameras on them so they can watch the food. So in this one study, they, um, they looked at uh, shelf life of the food. They gave them uh, worms, I forgot what the type of worm, but it was a type of worm and then nuts, and the worms were preferred. So what they do is they go hide the food, and then they would let the, the scrub jays in back a week later. And the first thing they went after were the worms. And then they did the same experiment and let them back in two weeks later. The first thing they went after were the worms. And then they did it three weeks, the first thing they went after were the nuts. And the worms were actually rotten by that point. And the birds seemed to understand the concept of the time. They didn't even bother trying to go get the worms. They went straight for the nuts. They also did another study where they, they had the camera on the uh, scrub jays. And the way it was written in the paper is almost like the graduate students were playing a cruel joke on the birds. So what they did was they let the birds go out and hide their food. And of course they had a camera on them and the birds could see the camera eye. And the uh, students would take the birds out, okay, move them back into the holding pens, and then they would go and move the food. All right, so go hide it and move it into different places. So they let the scrub jays back in. The scrub jays went to their, hide, their regular spots and were like, well, I have about 70% recall. Maybe a bad day. All right, maybe I'm, I'm not so good. So then they let the birds go hide food again and put them out in a new fresh field, camera's eyes on them, and they take the birds away and then the students go and move the food again. So the scrub jays come back in the field and they're like, something's wrong, you know. And they noticed that the scrub jay was staring at the camera eye, like, I know you're up to something. <laughs> so, they did let the birds do it again. The third time, the birds wouldn't hide the food. They just basically said, screw you. <laughs> Get your own food. So um, the birds are very intelligent. It's kind of interesting to watch. So Nicola Clayton sent me this. This is just an example of, of a scrub jay doing caching behavior. So um, what they do is they have um, ice cube trays, and they put a little thin paper over them, and they let the birds go and hide food in the trays, just like that, stuffing food in there. And they've learned that they've had to just the camera, such that the bird, the birds don't like the camera eye, okay, the, because they're always worried that camera's gonna steal the food from them. So, and rightly so, because apparently the students do. So anyways, that's what the caching behavior looks like. And it can be in a, a forest, they can be stuffing them in between tree bark or whatever it may be. Okay, we know that um, a lot of birds uh, forage socially. So we, and think about people. When you are by yourself, do you eat quickly or slowly? Quickly, that's right. But when you're with a bunch of friends, you're out having drinks or whatever else, you tend to spend a lot more time. And interestingly, birds do the same thing. Now, there may be another strategy in that when you have numbers, it's a lot safer to spend a little more time eating because you have more eyes watching for predators. So it may not just be just a social event. Okay, I do want to bring up again that feather destructive behaviors are very complex. Don't think of them as just a behavioral problem. <coughs> Consider that a lot of them are experiences that most of them have an underlying medical component. They also have an added behavioral component as well. So we don't want to just say that, um, that this is a behavior problem and also we don't want to just say that foraging is going to cure it. It's not. This is a tool as a part of our entire workup and treatment program. If you think about what behaviors most birds have on a day-to-day -day basis, there's four main behaviors. They're going to look for food, forage, right? They're gonna socialize with other animals, and okay? that's pretty normal. They're going to groom or preen themselves, and they're going to sleep. I would say that the fourth behavior is what I see over-exaggerated over in the vast majority of captive animals, and it's probably the most common abnormal behavior that I see is just excessive inactivity. But here's an idea, what if you take away one of those behaviors? The opportunity to forage, the opportunity to socialize, you have two main behaviors. Now, I'm, I'm throwing reproductive behaviors out of this, so we're not including that. So this is the idea of behavior displacement. If you take away one or more behaviors, the time must be filled with doing something. Either, either you're gonna spend more time doing one of the other behaviors, like grooming or sleeping, or you're going to introduce abnormal behaviors. The time must be filled doing something. And something, of course, can be sleeping, but you have to fill that time doing something. So that's kind of the idea of behavior displacement. Our limited literature in 
parents with uh, federally protected behaviors that have shown a couple identifiable problems. One, being a great parent. They're automatically targeted. But we know that it's not just great parents. It's just what the limited research has shown. Female birds have a higher incidence of feather damaging behavior. We also see a lot more reproductive problems, diseases related to feather damaging behavior. So, and those, that's an example of a medical cause. The inability, the absence of play behavior. So one of my questions that I ask clients is, does your bird actively play by itself? I don't mean you, you know, fussing with it. I mean, does it play on its own? And the other thing is no foraging. So we know that these are risk factors. And we know that in chickens, foraging is inversely correlated with feather damaging. So uh, a chicken that doesn't forage. Do you have people who keep pet chickens inside the house here? Okay. All right. Used to do. Used to. Oh my gosh. All right. So we see them too. And they come in and they're feather plucked. They pull out their feathers. And I ask them, what are you doing with your chicken inside the house? So, so we. So our, our cure is to stick them outside so they can scratch on the ground and everything else. And almost invariably that takes care of the issue. This is assuming they don't have mites and mice and other things. So another study with um, orange wing Amazons looked at the complexity of uh, the cage setup and all that to reduce psychogenic feather picking is what they called it. And more or less what they showed was that um, you know, she used foraging enrichment and physical enrichment. Physical enrichment is like ladders and swings and ropes and things like that. And foraging enrichment is obviously they had to work through devices to get the food out. The birds preferred the foraging enrichment and over the physical enrichment. A lot of times they used the physical enrichment to get to the foraging enrichment. However, it did help. It did reduce scores of feather damaging and so forth. Lots of studies in chickens. So there's actually pretty good stuff for that. We know that substrate preference is a big issue with chickens. We know that if we don't give chickens access to dust baiting at a very young age, they're much more prone to feather damaging behaviors later. Again, we talked about that. Um, there's a time period when you have to develop certain skill sets. Same thing happens with chickens. If you have to give it to them at a young age, and it does reduce the risk of feather damaging later. Okay, in this particular one, um, they did uh, broilers that hatched eight weeks of age. And they looked at different types of litter and so forth on the bottom cage. And really, having a pristine environment was a huge disadvantage developmentally for these animals. They needed something to dig and scratch in and look for stuff. That is a natural behavior. Um, chicks rarely uh, dust bathe with straw, but they do so with shavings. In this particular study, they did, if they gave them just 10 days of foraging experience at a young age, it set them up for life to, to do much better. And what they noted was the birds that had uh, that foraging experience at a very young age, if they later put them in a devoid environment, so kind of a sterile environment, those birds that had foraging experience fared much better. Some of them still did feather pick, but they responded very quickly once they were allowed to forage and do natural behaviors, as opposed to those birds that didn't have foraging at a young age, they very rapidly started doing feather damaging other abnormal behaviors and they were slower to recover once put in a more normal behavior or normal environment. So this is just an example, uh, Dr. Nicole took this picture, but there's uh, shavings on the left and, and straw on the right. That's kind of how they did this experiment. Okay, there's other risk factors in chickens. So we know high stocking, you know, crowded conditions, when they're about to lay, compacted litter, change the substrate, and there's a genetic predisposition in, um, in poultry. So, you know, we're not, we haven't really made that association in pet birds, but, you know, we also tend to select for birds that uh, maybe are not the best uh, pets, so they often have to go into a breeding situation, at least in the United States. So I don't know if that's an issue here. There's other things we know that birds that are given the choice, if they understand foraging, they know how to do the skill, they will preferentially choose to work for food over eat out of a bowl. The only times that they'll eat out of a bowl is if they're super hungry, they'll go eat out of a bowl first and then they'll go to the foraging house. So they preferentially want to work for the meals, especially if they've learned. It's, if they don't know what foraging is, they won't do it, but they have to learn or they've already known that experience. Okay, so I've got a case for you. All right, everybody on their toes, everybody ready? Okay, all right, so here's the case. We've got this beautiful, this, this uh, agar was in Central America. Beautiful, so it's tropical. If 
not familiar with aviary. So it's beautiful aviary. It's this huge dome type aviary. And there's two scarlet macaws in this. Um, so the substrate is kind of this volcanic rock, and kind of uh, uh, these rocks about this big or smaller. And, um, and you know, this was this wonderful exhibit. Everything looked wonderful. It's beautiful. There's plants growing. Everything's nice. And uh, the birds can fly freely in there. The birds are in beautiful feather. And then I watch this behavior. So I want you to see what this behavior is and then tell me what you think is going on. And I'll tell you that that's a rock he's chewing on. So you might think, oh, he's just chewing a rock. Well, I didn't show you the whole video. He did that the whole time I was there. So at least he's picking, could be picking at it. Okay, the owners reported no evidence of picking. So they did not see the bird going over there and chewing. And I will tell you, physically, the bird was fine. So there weren't any masses or anything like that. There was no obvious physical abnormality other than just the beast. Okay, so expand upon that. Well, the, it, the environmental damage from probably where the tree fall is or where the tree fall is or where the tree fall is or whatever kind of goes to flight. Okay. It's a route trace. So this route trace, when you see the birds do this, they go in one direction. Okay. So route trace is another form of stereotypy. Okay. And this is a locomotor stereotypy as opposed to an oral stereotypy. Oral stereotypies relate to lack of foraging opportunities. Locomotor stereotypies relate to lack of environmental enrichment, physical enrichment. So what I'm hoping you're starting to see is that we can, this, this, these two cases, start to differentiate what's wrong in the environment that we could possibly change to maybe help these animals. This is reported in finches because when they have barren cage environments, doesn't matter if you have for, foraging in there, you have barren cage environments, they, they, some of them will develop this route trace. They just go in one direction. What they're doing is they wear one wing, either the left or the right, and it's always just like that. Okay? It's because they're hitting the side of the cage. So our solution in this situation would be to make either a larger cage or break up the cage so that we have hide spots and other things. Barren spaces are not great for little birds. It's not a very secure environment. All right, does that make sense? Okay. All right, on to the next one. So now we've kind of led into stereotypies and all that. Abnormal repetitive behaviors are just inappropriate, repetitive, unvarying behaviors. So you have stereotypies, which are very different from impulsive, compulsive, or some people call obsessive compulsive behaviors. So I want to make the differentiation. Those are two different brain pathways, as have been identified in people and kind of extrapolated towards the animals. So there's always that that you have to keep in mind. Okay, um, and the other thing I want to make a point about this is they're, they're not treated the same, okay? Hopefully you've already seen that with stereotypies, we have two different types that we can just roughly categorize and we can already start to differentiate problems that we're gonna manage very differently. So with a locomotive stereotypy, the answer is not just foraging unless it involves moving around and involving other types of enrichment. And same thing with a big, beautiful environment is not necessarily going to stop oral stereotypes. And obsessive compulsive behaviors are really not, uh, they're in a different class altogether. And that's what those selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors were designed for, are those obsessive compulsive behaviors, not stereotypes. Okay, so abnormal repetitive behaviors that have no function is what a stereotypy is. Obsessive compulsive behaviors have a function or end goal. So for example, someone with OCD may close the door after they leave uh, the house. And then think, I want to make sure I close the door. And they go back and make sure the door is closed. And just, wait, I've got to check this. Keep going and checking this, all right? The thing about them is that human patients report that they know what they're doing is not right, but they can't get out of that loop. They're kind of stuck in that set place. And whereas a stereotypy has no function, okay? There is no function. We're not trying to close the door. We're just going in a loop, okay? There is no real function to that. Uh, we're just rolling a rock in our mouth or whatever it may be. Okay, 
Um, and of course, these are incompletely understood. Uh, we do know that uh, captive environments where the behaviors are frustrating. Remember I talked about the opportunity to have choice in your environment. When you remove choice from the environment, from that organism, abnormal things start to happen. And that's why it's so important that we give choices to our animals so they can do a couple different things. Um, and not all stereotypies indicate abnormal brain function. We know that abnormal brain function is a component because you can have, in humans, it's methamphetamine use, uh, certain types of brain injuries, certain types of schizophrenia and so forth, that they have these problems. So you can take a normal animal and you can have it have a maladaptive behavior and it starts forming stereotypies, not, and not just a malfunctioning behavior. So, this is kind of important to understand how things progress, because when we have patients come in that are showing stereotypies, I kind of try to figure out where they are in this spectrum, because the further down we go, the more severe and more difficult it is. We have ritualization. This is like the gray area where people say, is this a stereotypy, or is this, you know, the bird doesn't flip in the corner a few times, is that, abnormal, rolls food in its mouth a few times, is that just abnormal, is it just plain? You know, that's, that's hard to tell. But when you can elicit it more easily, that's the emancipation phase. And then it progresses to an established fixed behavior. In other words, they don't necessarily have to have a reason or some type of stimulus, they just do it. And then you have escalation where it increases in frequency. Okay, so the further down we go, the more severe the problem, the more ingrained the behavior, the more difficult it will be to change that. Um, there, are, there, there are a few studies, and not a ton in birds, but there are a few. Joe Garner, who is now at Stanford, I believe, um, has done quite a bit of work with stereotypies in uh, captive animals, whether it's a pig or a bird, a parrot, um, other types of species as well. Again, we have two main types of stereotypies, oral and locomotor. And if you understand that, you can very quickly start to differentiate why they're developing it, and what we can do to maybe change that. At the UC Davis Colony, they know that 96% of these birds were showing stereotypies, so it can be quite common. Okay, locomotor stereotypies, what are these? These are the things where they're walking around, they're doing corner flips, they're rolling around, on their, they're using their legs. So maybe you see them go back and forth on the perch, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. They do flips, they do these route traces, and again, that's lack of environmental conditions. Okay, so here's an example. This is actually from the UC Davis Colony. And you see this arguing Amazon is just doing a corner flip. And they do this over and over and over. And you'll, just in a moment, you're gonna see one of the backgrounds start to do that. There it goes. <laughs> so, not a good situation, but you know, that's, that's an environmental enrichment thing where we can increase the diversity in the environment and hopefully change that. Okay, oral stereotypies are these things, and probably you've seen this, where they're chewing on the wire, okay, or sham chewing. They just chew in the air. They don't necessarily even chew in anything. You see it in dogs, too. Um, food manipulation, dribbling, those types of things where they pick up something, drop it, pick it up, drop it, pick it up, drop it, over and over and over. And again, this is lack of foraging energy. Okay, so keep that in mind. So here's another study that's done on Arkling Amazon. It's also at UC Davis. They've done a lot of this work. Um, so they did 16 orangling Amazons, parent raised, 18 weeks. Um, they had movement in individual cages. They gave them 12 foraging and 12 physical enrichments, and they did it for 16 week periods and kind of monitored them throughout this. So the foraging enrichments, again, were used more frequently. We got a sense of that from the other study. The physical enrichments were mostly used to get to the foraging enrichments, very much like the previous study. And the controls that had no, no enrichments definitely developed more of these stereotypes. Okay, almost we kind of expect that. Um, it didn't eliminate the stereotypes. Again, we've raised these birds in emerald. They were raised in kind of a sterile environment, so they weren't exactly normal to begin with. Um, but we, we know that it didn't eliminate it, but it significantly did help. And these were young birds, so who knows how, as they got older, that would affect their life. And those are things we have to keep in mind. So the next slide, now this is an important one too. And I try to explain to people, they come in and they say, my birds, got this or that problem, and we recognize the problem, we try to develop an enrichment plan, I try to explain to them, you know, about the development of how this might go. So what we know about stereotypies in birds is there's four phases of these uh, development. One is the silent inception phase. 
When you look at the bird, it's fine. It seems fine. But things are going on up here, and maybe there's subtle changes. Maybe it's that early phase where they're starting to do a route trace or whatever that seems a little odd. But you don't really notice them too far. Then you have escalation. That's the phase where the, the behavior, the abnormal behavior is present. We're seeing, oh, okay, this is really an issue. And then we correct it with the magic correction, whatever that may be. And then you have the silent reversal phase, which means they're still showing the abnormal behavior. Okay? And, and then you have uh, ultimately the attenuation phase. And what we understand is that the de rate of development of the behavior may mirror the rate of cure. In other words, if they've been doing this for years, how fast are we going to change their behavior? It may take months to years. And it, it may be a lifelong of teaching. We know that um, the animals, it's not just birds, that don't learn those skill sets at a young age have a much more difficult time recovering from these behaviors. So, you know, the wiring is a little different. So we have to expect that it's going to take longer for these birds to improve. Or animals, it shouldn't be just birds. But again, if we're able to, to classify these <coughs> type of behaviors, then we're going to be better apt to be able to manage and help them. And Joe Garner is the one that's done it. I'm not going to get into all the, the details, but um, we know that um, extinction behaviors, so removing abnormal behaviors, is much more difficult in animals that have stereotypy and the ones that were raised in uh, devoid environments. They just weren't getting those skills. Harder to remove those behaviors. Okay, and I'm going to kind of move ahead here. And again, this is important, I think, is that when we see this, it does indicate poor welfare. So I try to not shame my clients into thinking, oh, you're doing a bad job, but just to make it important and that they understand that it can be a welfare issue. We want to help improve the welfare of the animals. And when we put it that way, almost all my clients will be like, yes, I want to do something to make this situation better. Okay. Um, I, I do want to bring up this, and that, this is the issue of studying abnormals to basically make conclusions in our research. And a lot of our animals are studied are abnormal. I work in labs and I see the rats and the mice and they're flipping around the cage all the time. I have lots of video of it. And we are studying those animals and putting them in as normals and doing a variety of different research. Sometimes it probably doesn't make a difference depending on the research. Maybe they've got pancreatic cancer. Maybe those corner flips don't have anything to do with it. Uh, or cage jumping or flipping. But if we're talking about behavior studies, especially in evaluating drugs, we have to consider that those may be very important. So when I read and I'm asked to review uh, literature and, and research papers, I want to know very specific details about how the animals were kept. Because that's very important. If they said, yeah, we kept them in eight by eight cages and we fed them this and that and they had 12 hours of light and dark and on and on, that's some really basic information. I want to know what else they did. What is the enrichment? How were they interacted with? How were they raised? All those things of information. If we don't know that, that's fine. I, but I want it in the paper. I want to make sure everybody understands that what we're starting with for our animals and here are the results based on what we started with. So just keep that in mind. This is an interesting study that came out that looked at uh, neurologic drugs. So 8% of neurodrugs uh, succeed in human trials. And this is about 80 to 90% positive in the animal trials, realizing they're studying abnormal animals. And then they're taking those abnormal animal results and then applying them in human trials. And no wonder we're not getting uh, good success rates. All right, so that has been brought up in other papers. Okay, we do know that um, birds that have uh, stereotypies have problems with offering pass, contra preloading, which is foraging, food store pilfering. We, we know all these are, are an issue. Okay. Okay, I want everybody to stand up. Wake up. Come on, stand up. Take it off, dance, sing, whatever you want to do. All right. I know it's hard to just sit and listen to someone blab, so I want to kind of move around. So before we go on this next, um, anybody have any questions? They're going to put you to the test, so it's not, y'all aren't just getting free lunch here, you got to work. I have a question. Yes? The birds that prefer to work for their food, yes. have they had 
Have they originally been always eating from a bowl, and that maybe they were given the option or chose to? Okay, so in the studies, like with pigeons and others, those birds naturally knew foraging. Oh, so they caught okay. wild pigeons, and they they were they were natural foragers. So if you were to introduce that to a bird that eaten from a bowl all its life, it's probably going to be like. Shh. That's right. It may look at this stuff like, what is that? You know. And if you deal with Amazon parrots, um, they oftentimes will be like, why would I work for food? I mean, it just lives in a bowl. I just go and eat. So some animals are reluctant to do it, and um, some we have to train. The wild-caught birds eat all day. I don't think there's any instances where they don't. Um, they may become accustomed to eating all day. They usually do. But a lot of times they'll prefer to forage. So some of the birds we have to train. So when I get a new bird in, that's like when I'm most excited. I'm like, all right, we gotta get this started, that started, and they're like, oh my gosh, I thought I was just going to, you know, get some blood work and have a poop look at or something. <laughs> no, 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 we want to do all these different things. In fact, we stage our exams, so I want to follow up with them. And uh, my poor clients are like, I, I did it, I followed up with both, you know. And I say, don't worry, we just keep, you know, we keep working on trying to get it to happen. It takes some time. So, any other questions? Okay, here's our next case. Adult chestnut mandible toucan. Beautiful bird, it's on display. Kept in this beautiful outdoor area, also in Central America, different location. And it seems perfectly comfortable with people. And coming up, it's uh, got this great diet. Look at this case though, it's just beautiful, you know? So what does this bird do? And if you, if you don't get this, you get an F. That's a piece of apple, by the way. And this bird did this for at least 30 or 45 minutes. I got tired of filming it. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, it's just rolling food and dribbling it. That's all it is. So what is this? Oral stereotypy. So what, what is the problem? Lack of foraging. He just had a food bowl. He had this beautiful tropical cage, and this is what he did. He just sat there and kept doing this over and over and over. Again, I offered suggestions, they weren't interested. So anyway, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but you know, these are things that I look at now when I go to exhibits. I'm like, oh, look at the abnormal behavior. Oh, there's another one. You know, I take pictures of it, video, and so forth. And that's what they do. Okay, so we've already gone through a program. All right, it's all fun and games until someone gets hurt. And if you want to, you can stand or you can sit down. So <laughs> we're, we're towards the last part of the presentation. All right, so you really have to consider that when you introduce a foraging protocol, an idea, whether you're talking about the little old lady with the little bird or the animal, whatever, pet, it doesn't matter or it's a large aviary or facility. We have to consider that we, when we introduce enrichment, there are potential consequences. And I'm not going to get into all the different forms of enrichment. We're just kind of touching, you know, covering some basic stuff. Um, so there's social enrichment. You know, and when you add in um, other species, other animals, you can have fights and injuries and other things. Social enrichment is the most enriching form of enrichment. Second one is foraging. Okay, just by the numbers in terms of how um, positively animals respond. And then you have sensory enrichment. You know, we have these CDs and DVDs of bird calls and other things. We think that the birds are going to love this. So they have music and they say, my love, my bird loves Metallica and the other ones love Mozart. You know, it's, they're not very enriching. And they've looked at all sorts of TV programs for animals and other things. And then you have, um, uh, you have occupational enrichment, which is a newer one. That's where the birds can actually work and make things happen. They can turn on and off switches and do things. I have some videos of those where birds are given the choice to turn on switches and they have power panels and they can do all sorts of things, turn on lights and fans and other things. So the social enrichment and the, and the foraging enrichment are the two main ones, okay? Um, but they can also cause problems, especially social enrichment. And we have to consider that if we add in a new toy, is the bird going to be freaked out by it? It may be. Um, and is it going to hurt itself? You know, I always tell people that if you add a toy and the bird starts chewing on it, if it is chewable and deformable, like they can break off pieces, if it's made of plastic, metal, or rubber, just assume that I will go surgically cut it out of your bird. That's what I tell people. 
So because that's that's what we do. They're practice builders. You know, if you want to uh, increase the lead and heavy metal exposure, then get this toy or whatever, and we'll go cut it out of your bird. So I would try to make it very apparent that if they're going to have these types of items, we want to make sure they're very durable so they can't destroy. And I do want destructible toys because we know that destructible toys are more often used than non-destructible toys. And if you're a kid, are you going to want to destroy a toy? Or are you going to want to just play with a block and just move around? You want to destroy it, right? So do animals. They like to destroy things too. So I always tell people, then get stuff that's made of natural components, such as wood, untreated wood, or paper, or things like that, that they can destroy and be safe. Um, you can have aggression. Um, we know that, that a number of animals, rodents are bad about this, that you put a favorite toy in and everybody tries to attack each other to get control of the toy. And some of them will hoard toys. Like you may have a toy for every animal, like the primate, and then one dominant primate will take all the toys and hoard them. You know, bully, right? So um, you just have to kind of look at the situation. So we always, that's why I do a lot of follow ups with my clients. I'm like, all right, how did this go? We wrote this beautiful program, right? It sounded great, it looks great on paper. The real question is, how did everybody do? And what do we need to, to adjust it? Did the keepers actually do it, or did the owner do it? And a lot of times the owners come back to me and say, oh, this was too hard. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I just need to know that. Let's work on plan B or C or D or whatever we need to do to make this work out for you. All right. Oops. Okay. Um, again, we must make this uh, program applicable to the bird. So it has to be something the bird can do. And realize that enrichment changes. Behavior is rarely static. And when it is, it's usually not good. We have to constantly evolve with the animal and we teach the owners to really work with the animal and figure out what does and does not work and change the protocol as needed. And again, it has to work with the owners. So that's a very important thing. So we're going to divide an enrichment program. Here are the goals of an enrichment program. We want to increase behavioral diversity. We're trying to elicit a larger, a wider range of behaviors. We want to um, uh, increase, well, again, the range of normal behaviors and reduce the frequency of abnormal behaviors. Um, increase the abilities, uh, the animal's ability to cope with challenges. This is a lot of times what we use for um, separation anxiety because the challenge and the stress is when the owners leave, especially with dogs, and we want to help them cope with the behavior um, and the problem that they're presented by giving them enrichment and other things so they have other activities to do. It's hard for a dog to be worried about mom and dad when they're busy getting their food from a little device. They haven't been fed all day long and their only food comes from this box and they've got to figure out how to get the food out of the box. They're more concerned, not always, but oftentimes about that food than they are about where mom and dad are. Okay, and increase positive utilization of the environment. Again, give the animal more choice in the environment. Um, do no harm is very important. Reduce stress in a measurable way. So we have to kind of monitor and see how this happens. Um, and with any type of study, we want to enrich both the animal and the study. Satisfy the guidelines. We have IACUC guidelines. I'm not sure if it's the same here. There's a different name, but it's probably similar animal care guidelines. Um, we want to watch after their welfare. And we can't burden the, the caretaker. It's an impossible task because it just won't happen. Last thing we want is to document strategies that work. So um, if we understand what works, then we can build off those. Maybe only one or two points work out of our whole plan, and then we go back and say, all right, these work. Let's build upon that. And we have a lot of clients that say, well, my bird will chew on its perch. I'm like, great, it chews on wood. So let's do this. Let's take pieces of wood, soft wood, drill holes into it, and stuff the food into the wood. Now the bird's got to chew for the wood to get its food. So we take advantage of what the bird is already doing and then just expand upon that. And again, you can apply it to other animals. Again, just keep in mind that behavior is not static. It's something that we have to um, we have to work on and continually adjust. And this was here in Australia. So some bird, I, what is that? Honey eater. A honey eater, yeah. It came on and pulled out my hair, I assume for a nest or something. <laughs> and uh, Shane Riddell was there taking pictures of me. So. As you would. Yes, as you would. So. All right, that's everything. So any questions? I gave you the abbreviated four-hour presentation. So we have a lot more cases and other things, so I try to get people involved with this. Yes? What percentage of people actually go ahead with this behavior? Most. Okay, but let me let me let me um, 
fall by now. So when I first started doing enrichment programs um, years ago, 15 years ago, I had all these ideas and I was so excited. I would come in the room, I would draw pictures for my clients, I would rediscuss things, I'm like, oh yes, and we set up appointments for the whole family to come in. So the whole family comes in, everybody's on board, the kids like, yeah, I wanna do this. And mom and dad are saying, this is great, we're gonna do it. And I'd follow up with them and I'd follow up and I'm like, the bird's not getting better. You know, I don't understand. Like, this bird over here did great. And we did the same thing, seemingly a similar situation, but the other bird, it didn't do so well. So I did a study. So I followed up with all my clients and I was trying to understand, document everything, trying to understand why it didn't work with one group and did with the other. So I hired somebody who was not me to, and had a questionnaire and I had her ask all of my, um, all the people in the study on this very set questions. So things were like, we were talking about building a foraging tree and getting the birds recording. All of my clients, according, according to my version of the questionnaire, yes, we did this, we remember you discussing this, you brought the whole family in, we had this big discussion, on and on and on. Oh yes, I remember you telling me this, this was great, I don't know why I didn't work our birds. And then her version was like, Dr. Reckles told us to do what? I, I don't understand, the foraging what? We didn't do any of that, I don't know, I don't have a clue. And they were on and on about, we never did, oh yeah, we never did that. I mean, that guy, no, never. So we didn't do that. So it very quickly became apparent to me that just because I talked with them, they were responding to me the way I wanted to hear the answer. So we had to change the way we approached this. We did more measurable things, and now I'm on to them. When they say, well, I did this, and I, I'm pretty straightforward with them. So I'm like, no, you didn't. So I'm like, I did, I did, they did. And then they go, you're right. <laughs> so I said, we have a client beating room. We can get the answer out of you. And they're like, okay, I didn't do it, I promise. So what we do is I say, all right, that's fine. That's not a problem. What worked and what did not? So well, I have no time. Okay, okay, that's fine, but you have time to feed the bird, obviously, otherwise you'd be dead. So let's just change where you feed the bird. Let's just try something simple. Get a couple little foraging devices. Don't even get foraging devices. Put five feeding bowls in the cage. Like, okay, I can do that. And just put a teaspoon of food in each one. Don't put gobs of food in one place because they're just gonna sit on that one aisle and just, okay, and there's five options, they're probably not even go to the other four. They're just gonna be there. So we work with whatever they have. And that dramatically improved my success. So I accepted that my clients didn't listen to me, pay attention at all, and take any of the material that I sent them. And I said, okay, I can deal with that. What can, what works for you? All right, any other questions? All right, 